Okay, welcome everybody to the uh, Belmont Plateau Hall of Fame show. I'm your host, Dave Thomas. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we're, idea of the show is we kind of spend a, a little bit of time with a guest each, uh, each time we have it with uh, someone who has some uh, connection with Philadelphia and with our vast history of distance running here in Philadelphia, whether it's on the track, the road, or, or cross country. So today I'm happy to have uh, an old legend here in the area uh, Derek Ringo Adamson. I'm going to spend some time with Ringo and talk about his career and his connections with Philly and his running and his coaching and all that kind of stuff. So just sit back and, uh, you know, enjoy yourself. So welcome, uh, Ringo. I'm going to just kind of go over a couple of, uh, your stats here. Um, first of all, unusual, he's a Jamaican born distance runner. So that's <laughs> kind of, you know, uh, most of us, we all know the sprinters from Jamaica, but you know, there's a good amount of distance runners that come out of Jamaica, too. Uh, I competed in the 1984 and 1988 Olympic Games in the marathon, also the 1990 Commonwealth Games. Um, his main time to Philadelphia was he, he won the Philadelphia Marathon in 84 and 85, clocking up time of 216.39 for the first time and 218.27. And that 216 was actually a Jamaican national record at the time. And... Uh, I'll ask him if it still stands. And that time actually still stands as the seventh best Philadelphia Marathon time of all time. So even though it was set back in the 80s, that was a strong time. It still holds pretty, pretty solid weight here in the area. Um, and then after his running career, you know, he moved, moved on to a long coaching career, which we'll talk about, um, at Gloucester County. Uh, uh, and then he moved on to, um, you know, which is known as Rowan today. And our day it was known as Glassboro State. And that's where Ringo ran, ran for uh, Glassboro. Um, Four-time All-Conference in the steeplechase, was fourth in Jamaican trials in the steeple in 1980. And he was the NCAA Division III national champion in steeplechase in 1980. Um, I imagine you ran for uh, Coach Oscar Moore, I guess? Yes. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about that. So welcome, welcome aboard, Ringo. Thanks for coming to and uh, talking with us today on the uh, Hall of Fame show. First of all, my first question is, where's Ringo come from? Uh, well, you know, you probably shouldn't have not made the show then 30 minutes, you know, but I'm gonna try <laughs> to cut through it uh, real quickly. I get that all the time, man, you know? Um, and all that came about was when I first came here to the country, actually, uh, I did not know, you know, what cross country was. And uh, when I first got into it, you know, instead of telling you everything from the beginning there, uh, you know, the first race I run, ran was down at Brookdale Park in Bloomfield. And the interesting thing was I had no clue how far back then in those days three miles was because back home, the interesting thing is I knew kilometers because our road signs, everything's in kilometers and liters. So I know those measurements. Actually, when I was in high school, when we were learning the metric system, never will forget it, it was 1978. And the teacher was amazed that how do I know, you know, the complicated things to them at that time as the metric system. And I didn't know, you know, feet and yards and all that, but uh, no one ever take time to understand the culture where it was coming from, you know what I mean? Yeah. But anyhow, I remember down there, I was running along and um, it was a three mile race that the first race I ever ran. My best friend was Jeff Poor that went on to Amherst, did some great things there, you know, businessman now in New York City. But um, the thing about that was I came up to a point on the course where I didn't know where to go right or left. So I just stopped and um, my uh, high school coach, Dennis Murray, who was also my history teacher, um, he said, Adamson, what you doing? You know, I said, look, I, uh, one arrow to the right, to the left, I don't want to run any further than I have to, you know? So he goes, go to the right, and I took off. By that time, the crowd was already down on me and uh, took off again. I could see on top of the hill where the finish line was, so I run towards that. So the first race I ran at five kilometers, I, I ended up winning it. 
So the next day was all over the intercom in school and big hoobla and so forth. At that time, I have no idea what I did. So you always want to try to get me to come to practice. So I never wanted to go to practice because I don't want to endure those type of pain, you know? So I would just try to hide away all the time, man. And I remember in North Jersey that time on Channel 7, they had the uh, 430 movie. And every week they have a different theme. But this week was Western. In Jamaica, we love Western films. But there was this movie that was on, I didn't want to miss it, you know, called Ringo and His Golden Pistol. It was in black and white. White. Watch it many times, you know, uh, starring Mark Demon. So I went, I told him, finally, he cornered me. I said, I got to go home because I have to watch Ringo and His Golden Pistol. So, of course, you know, you have your cross-country team around you. I couldn't believe why they were laughing because they thought I was making up something. So from there on, they start calling me Ringo and so on and, and so forth. That's how the name got stick. Actually, I graduated from Glassboro State. Not many people knew it was Derek Adamson. So actually, some folks thought Derek Adamson was taking classes for Ringo Adamson. So that's how that part <laughs> come about, you know? Got you, man. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty interesting. So I end up naming my son Ringo Adamson. Derek. That's his name. Uh, well, what brought you up here, uh, by the way, uh, to the Jersey area from uh, Jamaica? What was the, the connection? Well, I didn't have any choice, you know. When you're a young boy, man, growing up in Ireland, you, you, your parents say you do such and such a thing, you jump and you just do it. Okay. You ask no question. Seven. So my mother was living up in uh, Verona. My mother came here prior and was a domestic maid for a family up in Verona and Pease Avenue. Dr. Lisser was an optometrist and Mrs. Lisser was a corporate lawyer over there in New York. So my mother came here, worked for them, got here through another family that they knew down in Jamaica in Kingston, bought her here. Eventually they bought myself up and my sister, my sister hated, they had to send her back home. She hated it, you know, the cold and all that. A year later, she came. But uh, I came, so I said, I must endure. So uh, live in Pease Avenue, man, awesome place, man. Uh, on top of this hill, live in the same house and stuff with them. But my God, that man taught me so much things, Dr. Lisser. Uh, you know, you got to remember, when I was down there in Jamaica, and a lot of people don't even know this, first time I sat foot in a school system, I was 15 years old, never been to school in my life. It's pretty interesting. So anyhow, right there in Bloomfield Avenue, it's now a middle school that used to uh, uh, be the high school. So I got placed there, never was placed in a regular school system, in a regular classroom, sorry. So my classmate was a blind kid mm. so every day we sat there we walked to the cafeteria together and we sat in this little cubicle man and the teacher would teach us i remember having those little blue books having one of those little uh camera thing that flashed the work onto the wall i don't know if you remember this and then you see it and you do your work right oh, yeah. the craziest thing with that man that boy in there man, i spent so much time around him so I would teach him things, stuff about Jamaica. He was intrigued with that. He would teach me things. So he taught me how to read Braille. I know to do that too. Yeah. It's pretty interesting, you know? One day I was at, I went to the bank, you know, and, and they're messing around with the uh, thing on the side. I think my wife, I don't remember. It says, uh, what are you doing? I said, yeah, I know what this is. It's Braille. I know how to do this. So I said, why are you so fascinated with it? And this is a joke, you know, I said to her, well, what's impressed me the most is the guy who drove here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Kind of dumb. <laughs> you know, but uh, I came up and uh, I would come on man in the evening and that man will sit on, we call it veranda down in Jamaica. You guys call it a porch you'll sit on and he will smoke his pipe with his tobacco and give me books to read and I would read them. I remember one book I read. I had no idea what the hell I was reading. You know, reading something about New York Knickerbocker and some guy named Walt Fraser. 
I had no idea what the heck basketball was or who the heck Walt Fraser was. But as time goes on, I understood that. And uh, the interesting thing with it, never knew what that man was doing. Now, you got to understand now, in Verona, at that time, the entire community was predominantly Jewish and Italians. Yeah. Most of all my friends that I grew up around, people don't even know this. They were Jews and Italians. I learned a hell of a lot from them. <laughs> They're the same folks that taught me how to ice skate in the middle of Verona Park, because there's a lake there. Taught me how to fish. They taught me how to ski, which most people don't know I even know how to do. Uh, we used to ski up there, and I don't know if you remember, I don't know if you, you know Mount Vernon? I know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, man, used to go up there and we'll do that lots of times and ski. He used to take me to Ranger hockey game inside Madison Square Garden, you know? So I was fascinated with hockey, you know? Them type of things, pretty interesting. But I gotta tell you this, but you know, that's how I got there. And you see, like now we're going through some trying times, but I must be honest with you and say this, this is 1975 now, I live in this town. That's right. I never saw another person who looked like me, but I'm gonna say this, not one day in my entire upbringing in that town with those folks, anyone have ever said one derogatory things to me. And I walk and I go and I was accepted. And this is the head 1975 now, you know what I mean? Well, what the heck become of us up until this time? Pretty interesting. That's right. Yes, sir. Well, you made it to uh, Glassboro. Mm -hmm. uh, we ran with some great, some really good runners there too. Uh, uh, I mean, you became a steeplechase uh, runner, I imagine, cross country, but um, well known for that bike. I guess some runners, it was Jack Cruz was there, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew a couple other great runners out of that, out of Glassboro State at the time. And uh, coached by a Hall of Famer, uh, Oscar uh, Moore. So you had a lot of, lot of good inspiration, a lot of good guidance there. A lot of support. And support, yeah. But uh, we're going to focus more on after Glassboro, right? So um, after, Glass, after Glassboro, uh, being Philadelphia, we, we want to talk about that Philadelphia Marathon. Now, what kind of led you, you know, you, you graduate Glassboro, what year now? 83, 83. technicals, I had to do student teaching, something I didn't want to do, wind up there by mistake too. <laughs> <laughs> now, what led you to the marathon? Well, uh, Fritz used to do some interesting things. Uh, to be honest with you, I still do some of those things up until this day because it's the right thing to do. Well, and um, he used to bring me on these long runs on Sundays, you know, and uh, really, he says, you're getting very good like at this because I don't know, I think he was trying to get me ready for post-collegiate type running because he mm -hmm. figured there was a lot more left there in the tank because, yeah, you were right. I was among some dangerous runners that was in here back in yep. those times. You're 100% correct. So, uh, you know, I think he took me under this wing and I know why he took me under the, the, the wing. Here I am in a strange land. Here I am trying to learn and do the best that I can at something and still hinder with some sort of fear because I have no idea where you're going. And the only thing that stand in front of a man or a woman that they could never see is their future, you know? You can't see that. So I guess he was steering to me to get to somewhere where that is concerned. So anyway, this one particular Sunday, the first one I ever ran, he goes, there's a marathon race in Philadelphia. Mm. Run 20 miles every day on Sunday. I'm going to bring you there. I don't share this much with a lot of people to run this race. So I said, heck, I have people to run with, why the heck not? So he handed me a pair of racing shoes, still not, didn't click in my head. Remember, these things weren't even broken in. He just gave them to me and said, run. At 20 miles, he said he will be there waiting for me to pick me up in the car. Well, I got to 20 miles. He was in the car. I looked around. I remember the Philadelphia Marathon course is not what it is now. Right. And I think I know you would know this too, where you have to climb the Monyunk Hill. 
That's right. <laughs> That's a beast, you know? Well, man, I gallop up that thing, man. It was a pack of 15 of us. When I came back down that hill, there was only six left in that pack. Well, I figured one thing out in my head. I got to uh, 23 miles, so I said, I got to start manage things. Not so much of the race. I start doing some calculating in my head how mm -hmm. much money I could make this day. That's what I did as a good manager. It's part of coaching. You know that. You know, so I start figuring this out. Well, to honest to the good Lord, I, uh, I got to 24, but I could see my legs coming up. Mm -hmm. But I could not feel my legs touching the ground. You know, I said, good God, I only got one more point something miles to go. So I push it again, you know? And uh, mm. this coach one time down in Jamaica is past now. Herb McKinley always said to me, mm. the only pace is a suicide pace. So you must accept that day to die, but not, you know, literally. I accept that that day. So I kept going, finished third. That's how I made the Olympic team, the first mm -hmm. one ever run. Well, that gave me a lot of things and inspired me to come back, man, and uh, even do better. Yeah. Now, uh, in that Philly, that first Philly race, 216. Mm -hmm. uh, remember well, the 216 was the second one. The first one was 218.03. That's when I made the team. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, you remember the competition? But you're good, you know. Remember the competition? Was, was Dave Paris? Who was your main right. competition? And I, I always praise him and thank me for that because that man, I wouldn't say push me. He had the same intention to win too. Why mm -hmm. wouldn't you? You know? So I latch on because I knew he had a lot more experience. I was the young pup in that right. thing. So I bit on. I said, I'm not letting loose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, now we'll, we'll skip ahead to your, your marathon experience. So you, you made... Um, what the 84 and the 88 team. So yeah. any memories of that? I mean, I know your times weren't what you kind of was open, I guess, but we can kind of talk about that. Um, first one was in the USA, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. 84. Mm -hmm. I remember it being a hot day. I remember uh, oh, man, that was brutal. Lopez winning it. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, give us your experience from Los, from Los Angeles. Well, I, 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 I went there and I arrived. I didn't go straight there into the uh, Olympic Village. I wind up in New Mexico where we set up camp and we were there training for a while. Old team. And I would run these dirt roads, man, every morning. It was beautiful. I love it, actually, you know. Then we made our way into UCLA camp, a set up camp there. And we'll train there again. You know, talking about camp, one of the other things I had with that, I, uh, I spent, and the guy, uh, I think he hung with me for two miles. People don't even know that. I didn't even know it was until he told me his name and all that. And I was doing some training work and on the cool down. I would just keep going training on LA track. And he would do the cool down and stuff with me. It was Rob Lowe. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I never knew the guy was going to end up becoming what he did, but you know. Uh, but he was quite fascinating, and him and I would sit there and just chat and stuff at times. But um, L.A. was my first one, and then that race came about. That daggone Olympic village was pretty intense. The people you ran into, you know, it's pretty amazing. Sure. I think what got me scared so much, I went out to the track one day to get my work out in. And you mentioned Carlos Lopes. So I said, I'm not stepping out here with all these guys out here. I'd rather do this. John Tracy was on there. And I'll never forget it. Carlos Lopes is running two mile reps, repeats on the track. As a good Lord liveth, I will not tell a lie about any of this. His slowest one was 852. So I said, I know I could hit them down probably in a round because prior to going in there, I'm hitting 918. I thought I was a big wheel. I'm like, shoot, I look embarrassing in front of these cats, you know? <laughs> so anyway, uh, Herb McKinley, those thoughts and stuff that he told me, I always linger in my head. So that race, that morning, that was so intense. So they bust you up, because it was point to finish. 
man, you get on that bus, man, and if you drop a dime, you could hear it. It felt like you were going to your morgue, you know? No one talked to anyone. You sit there, you got your bib and everything, and you get out there to place you in these tents with eight other guys, snacks in there for what you need before the race, and you have your water bottle of what you need to place at the rest stop for taking in water. It was scary. Well, race start. The interesting thing is, remember, Alberta Salazar was in that race. That's right. Man, I got to 15 miles as the good Lord liveth. And here comes Alberta Salazar going by me right in my head at that time. I think this is where I lost it. I said, my God, it's either I'm going too fast or Alberta Salazar is having an awful day. You know, I PR'd at 15 kilo and I kept going. But what uplift me, and I, got, I don't know where these people were, and I got in that stadium, I just get another little high because I heard my names and this group of people sitting there, and I got back to New Jersey, I realized it was a crew here from up in South Orange, it was Dean Shantz and all them bunch from the Sneaker Factory. Pretty interesting, huh? Yeah. Yes, sir. So you finished, uh, what, 52nd there? Yeah. 225. Mm -hmm. Next year you come back to Philly, you win Philly again. Yeah. 85. Yeah. So a lot of condensed, tough racing in a short amount of time. Uh, I was learning. In this process, I was gaining experience. No one ever taught me what I was going to deal with on the international level and stuff that I was going to run into. So, hey, mm -hmm. look, man, I had to take my chance. And when you throw into that pit, you got to find a way to work your way out. Yeah. Now, any memories from the second Philly win? You, get, you went in there being, okay, I got to win this thing again. I mean, what, what was that experience? Uh, what was the competition? Well, I just dig down into training deeper. When my son was running for Glassboro High School, he asked me to coach him. I show him some of these things. Because you got to know what you have to deal with and how good you want it to become. And they're sitting out there in the back of the house in the shed every darn training log. So I pulled out the training log and I showed it to him. Not mm -hmm. that you say you're to do this because you probably do this. You probably won't able to walk for like a couple of weeks at least. But I showed him this training log and you, you came up during these times, man. It's about mileage, you know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, there was eight weeks in there. I think the lowest amount of miles I ran was 135. So I trained three times a day, you know? And I would rest and I would get up and I would go to school. Uh, I'll go do student teaching and I'll come back again and I'm hitting this thing again, you know? So I, I, uh, <laughs> I used to, on Sunday when I did my long run, before those marathon, I would take three water bottles the day before, put them in the freezer, and I would freeze them. I put one at five miles underneath a bush, another one at 15 miles, I'm sorry, 10 miles, and another one at 15. So when I used to get there, I knew where the bottles, water bottle was under the bush. And sometimes I'd pull one up. I always take some water at five miles because at five miles, I didn't need it. In my mind, if I wait until I need it, it may be too late, you know? So I'll pick up that bottle and sometimes you see some of the ice still sitting in the bottom. And I'll take a couple of sip, throw it back in the bushes. If I feel like taking the other one when I get to 10, so be it. A lot of times I'll skip the one at 15. So I just trained myself. Mm -hmm. So I knew exactly where in the course, where to fuel myself. That's how I did it. So, and basically, I was so prepared for that. And it's like with coaching, you know, you're a coach. And the same thing I tell these kids, how, you know, I mean, you can't go and learn how to coach reading some book. Most of everything in my life, I learned by experience. Experience is the greatest education to a human being in my, in my, my view, you know. So um, I always tell them, man, if you prepare every day for one moment, you do all the things that is necessary and not everything will go right every day, mm -hmm. but you're preparing. And when you step on that starting line, 
if you have confidence in your preparation, what does it matter? Who is to the right or left of you? What does it matter? You're there to get a job done. Yep. Great advice. I was ready. Mm -hmm. Now you were ready, so you got that way. You came back in 88, Seoul, Korea. Mm -hmm. Another international experience for you. Mm -hmm. what, was that all, what was that all like? I mean, now you're in a foreign country. Yeah. And you're, and you're more experienced. And here you are with the marathon again. Yeah. Uh, that was a very interesting thing, being in there in the village. I got used to that part of it, you know. Going in there, staying in there, and going through. I didn't get too much caught up in any all the hype and stuff because I wanted to do well. But that was the weirdest and strangest marathon race mm -hmm. I've ever been in. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning, along the course, you'll go on, you know, like in over here in New York City and stuff, you would have, you know, you have all those people lining on the street screaming and hollering. Sometimes they get you to hype up, you, you run faster than you really want, and next thing you know, you're out of sync. You know what I mean? Well, the craziest thing with that over there and the back on the outskirts, which they didn't show too much. Man, the street was just lined with soldiers with guns and everything is kind of intimidating. And you're mm -hmm. working your way through them, no one hollering, no one screaming for you, and these guys don't smile, you know? And uh, I said, man, I'm like, why is all this? Why do we have this? I'm thinking, oh, I can't be spending my mind too much with that. I'm just here to run. Yeah. So Herb McKinley, late Herb McKinley goes, listen, when you come to these meets, you got 3 million plus people down in your country. You know what I mean? Uh, they want you to do well. You don't have to win, or win things to go and do well. You represent them and you want to energize yeah. others to come to uh, get involved in this. So, you know, he goes, you always carry them on your shoulder and all the other people, your family and everyone else, your school, you carry that too on your shoulder. It's really true, you know? So I tell my girls here on the team, I tell them all these things, you know what I'm saying? You go out and you put on this prop stuff and so forth. You gotta carry the burden of the school on your shoulder, you know? Everything in my life of what I do, I carry it on my shoulder. I'm proud of it, yes sir. Yeah, well, I've, you had a great career. Now, um, any any memories of any other races in Philly? I remember you running down Atlantic City all the time, but uh, I guess in Philly you ran Broad Street, right? Or do you yeah, know? that's the one that always denied me. I always wanted to win that darn yeah. thing. You know what I mean? And I remember one year, I know you know this guy's name, and he's a big daggone investor now with Vanguard and all that. And it's like I chase him down Broad Street. I think I went through a little bit hard because the son of a gun was fit that year. I think I wind up getting fourth. I could never pull that darn thing off. And I think he ran like 47, 27. It was Sounds Jimmy right. Norris from St. Joe's. That's right. Remember Jimmy? Tough runner. Yeah, tough runner, Jimmy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, and one and, of your guys uh, won it a few times, Jack Cruz, I remember he Jack won it. Jack Cruz, he times. won it. And I'm like, I'm the, that just inspired me. I'm like, if that's my teammate. I'm like, if he could win this, I know I could pull this darn thing off. Yeah, the best I could have done was fourth. I don't know. Uh, uh, maybe, I don't know. Maybe, you know, the day of the race, it just wasn't meant to be, you know. But mm -hmm. I did have some great runs there. Yeah. We had a great career. So what transitioned you into coaching then? I mean, uh, you, you're, you're kind of, when did you end your career age-wise? Roughly 30s? No, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, out of running. Yeah, I'm going to say right there. I could feel Seriously, it coming right. right right around in the 30s. Yes, 100%. You know, and I said, oh, God. Uh, this thing is just like, you no know, wearing on me. Where can I take this? You know, what else can I do with it? You know, I said, uh, hey, look, I enjoy it, uh, and I'm just going through it, you know, and um, yeah, it was right around there. And even now, I go out, and I don't tell people, well, I'm going to say it now, but I usually don't like to tell people much of this, but ever since this COVID thing started, I've uh, been running, so in my head here, refused to, mm -hmm. I said, well, 
I'm just going to keep running without missing a day until COVID ends. That's, my, that's what I'm doing. Just going to run. So if I get injured, I must run. So for me to consider the run a run, it must last for a mile or more. If it's under that, it's not a run. That's right. If I'm injured, that's right. Well, that's the great Ron Hill's thinking. If you remember Ron Hill, yep, he had mm -hmm. the record. I think he ran probably close to 30 years, never missed a day. Even ran in an airport. He got stuck in an airport, got his two, mm -hmm. at, least, at least two miles in, counts as a run. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But what advice, I mean, you've been a long time coach now. I mean, so you coached high school, correct? Yeah. Um, moved on to Gloucester, uh, Gloucester, and then you moved on to, uh, which is now Rowan, mm -hmm. um, al along the way there. What's been your philosophy, you know, would you say, of coaching and, you know, your experience? Like, what would you pass on to anyone who's listening today, um, you know, who wants to think about getting into coaching cross country and especially, I know you primarily coach women. Mm hmm Well, I would say, trust yourself. Have confidence, you know, in yourself. If you don't know something, ask. There's always a lot of people in that field you could reach out to. I don't know, mentor, you could ask them questions. They've been here a lot longer than you have, you know. And that's where I just kind of flow with it because I like it. And the journey for me kind of is kind of like backwards because I didn't follow any formula in any way. Meaning I got out of Rowan with a teaching degree, never taught a day in my life. And uh, the first job I, I got was going to a guy came up to me, he goes, just watching you and talking to me, he goes, you could make a heck of a whole lot more money doing other things than doing this. I said, oh yeah, why? So he says, people will gravitate to you. That's exactly quote for quote the word he used, never will forget it. He goes, he goes, I could show you how you could be a very good insurance agent working for Northwestern Mutual. Actually, I look back now, I think it was one of the best things. I, I learned a lot about business, a lot about investment, yeah. I learn about insurance a lot, you know? Well, it was wearing on me, you know what I mean? I came back one day and there was a job open up down at Gloucester County College. It's pretty much a great place. I would even call it a job. What you get paid to me is a waste of time, you know? But I wanted a coach. That's where my passion was. So I took that and I just started recruiting. No one taught me how to do it. I used my insurance skills to recruit it was the same thing same thing so i just went out there man what a dynasty i pulled off down there with that those guys yeah and up until now whole bunch of them you know i may wind up with a couple of them their kids here uh and they all went on and did some great stuff so i start mixing it up down there but I was in the wind down of my career, so I would run with them. I would teach them things. Man, we went on, coach, and we won five regional championships. And this was when they did not have JUCO Division One or Three. That's it right. was just Division One. We went into Dagon, South Dakota, Finish 11, Gloucester County College in a JUCA team among all these JUCA team that was giving scholarship, the Blinn, the Ranger community, the Odessas, man, we were up against them. And these guys held their own, you know, finishing 11 that day and that stuff. So I look back at that and go, man, this is darn pretty good here uh, yeah. doing this. The interesting thing with that, I don't remember what year team. We're the only Juca team on planet Earth that almost perfect score a region meet. Those boys score 17 points one day in a region meet. Oh. It was ridiculous what they did, you know? And we used to go down to Agerstown. Remember Agerstown, Maryland with those good teams? Sure. We shook him one Saturday down there, man. They never bought us back. <laughs> it's yeah. a truth. Yeah. That's how it works, man. <laughs> yeah. Never bought us back, man. And um, then from there, you know, 
uh, when I came back from Seoul from the Olympic Games, my whole coach here, Fritzy, mm -hmm. struggling there a little bit. They gave him the men and the women. I'm like, the old man is having some rough time. So I said, look, give me these girls. I'll work with them. I'll do it for nothing, which I did. So I'll gather them up. Got some kids transferring in here. Use the same kind of technique I did down at Monster County College. Make a long story short. I think it was 95 or 94, don't quote me here. Put a darn team together, man. These darn girls up in Lehigh at the region meet. This is pretty interesting. I gotta tell you this. This is one of the most powerful things I think I've ever done. So anyway, we went up there. You remember Allentown College? I think it's the sales now. It's the sales now, yep. Yeah, yeah. So we went there and uh, they used to have the Allentown Invitational. So we went there. At the time, we were in uh, the middle, uh, not the Atlantic region, the Mideast, right? Mideast, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we, uh, that day we lost to Moravian by um, 11 points. Never will forget it. And we're driving home. And I told these girls, I gave them a little pep talk. I said, when we come back here from region, we will win. So we're coming back home in the van, Fritz is in the front with the van, I'm in the back with another van. And I could hear, you know, a young lady, never forget her name, man, Antoinette Elton, talking to some of the girls, you know, how he thinks we're going to win when we just lost by 11, blah, blah. So I pulled the van over, so Fritz probably thought I had a flat tire and he pulled <laughs> over. I said, girls, all right, everybody in the van, you know, up in Allentown, you know, those little roads and the van leaning off to the right, you know, because oh, yeah. there's not much shoulder, you know? <laughs> So, uh, so they all came out, they thought something was wrong. I never will forget it. I said to them, listen to me, when we come back here, we'll win. And I laid it out to them how we were going to do it. And we came back and they conversation changed in the van. Man, I was still working for Northwestern then. Those darn girls every day was sitting on the steps that lead up to Fritz's office, waiting for me to come home from work to go to work. Man, did they work. Well, we went back to that region meet. They won the darn thing by three points. Mm. And I will not, because the story I told you earlier remind me of this. Moravian never came out and got their awards. <laughs> they were stunned. That day that the Nationals was at Lehigh, that team got 11th. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why you're, you know, a great coach. It starts with passion, it starts with uh, experience, and also... Recruiting, which you're yeah. the master of. Uh, I guess before we, end, that's, before we end this uh, Hall of Fame show here, I just want to, one last question. Um, mm -hmm. You go back with a great tradition, which I always loved, because um, I ran some of these races, the Browning-Ross races, and Browning is in our Hall of Fame. He's actually in our Belmont Plateau Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, people know him as a, as a fantastic uh, long time runner for Villanova and, you know, uh, and Olympian and all those things. But people our age know, know him as the guy who put in these little low key races and have stuff in the back of his car and you go run a race with no permit, no nothing. And, you know, just for fun and competition. And you kind of picked up the slack there and, and you actually keep these races going. So, um, you know, thank you for that. And uh, you have any memories of Browning? Yeah. Um, Give us one story. Well, Fritz used to, he used to just put him on anywhere, you know what I mean? That's how I found out actually about Avalon because he would go down there and put those little two mile runs on the beach. I don't know if you knew this, you know? Oh yeah, I ran the six uh, mile he put on. Ran in two of those. And he goes, yeah, we have these races, could be anywhere. One they used to have down at uh, the YMCA down in Woodbury in the back there, there's a lake there, would run around. The man never knew how far the daggone course was. You're just showing up with your shoes, you know, you're going to run, right. you know? So um, I showed up down there uh, one, um, I think it was on a Wednesday, I believe, not sure, but showed up there on a Wednesday and yeah, you used to have all this stuff out the back of the truck, you run, you pick what you want, but this one Wednesday, he had a watch. So they said, anyone who would win this race will get the watch. So some good runner showed up for this ridiculous watch, you know? So 
That day, there was a fella named Mike Mantini from Woodbury. Man, we came neck and neck right to the end. So Brownie claimed that he couldn't figure out who won. So he goes, come back again next week and settle the score. That's exactly what he said, you know? So you figure as young kids, you'll be mad and don't come back. Not us. We were right back there again, <laughs> trying to get that watch, you know? I actually end up that day winning that thing and received the watch, you know, just to say, hey, look, man, I got this, you know, uh, uh, from Browning. And he used to always have these little uh, kooky things to say, you know. I remember one time he goes to me, he goes, you know, this is so dumb. He goes, you know, all right, before this race, he goes, okay, start off slow and then you ease off the pace. I'm like, who the heck is going to do that? You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, stupid little things like that. But, you know, in his own little way, he was just funny, you know, this stuff. And as a young kid, man, you take that and, uh, you know, and, 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 and go with it. To be honest with you, I didn't ask to go and take over those fun runs. There's a fellow here on Rowan campus in the math department, Dr. Tom Osler. Yeah. So I came over to Fritz's office one day and when it was Browning pass away, you know what I mean? That was a sad time and the funeral and all that. But um, he goes, we want to keep these run going. And he goes, you are Ringo. And I was young. I would say that, not that young, you know, I mean, it's not my age now, but um, he says uh, to keep this run because people want to do it. Me and Tom goes, I'm not good at organizing things. And he goes, how about you, Ringo? I said, I think this is 1998 now, maybe. I go, yeah, I'll try it. I had no idea I would be still doing them up until this time. I mean, we run back here every Sunday, man, back in those trails. Yeah. Man, it's a lot of fun. The numbers goes up, people are out there, kids show up out there. They put their mask on, they, if the run goes off, they take it off. We have trash can, we got everything there now that we need. You know, and I think in this time that we're going through, yeah. I encourage people and you know, they're listening on to the show, go out and run. In this, what you're dealing with right now, why would you not want to do that and strengthen your lungs? That's right. God forbid if you did were to get this, you know, your immune system, everything, you could fight this thing off. You know what I'm saying? I hear you. What is to be must be, man. What is to be must be. Well, I'm going to end it right here, Ringo. We're, we want to thank you for coming on the show, uh, giving us a little memories of, uh, you know, your past running and your coach and everything. We're glad that you joined us here on the Belmont Plateau Hall of Fame show. So, uh, you know, everybody, uh, join us next time when we have another guest uh, with some connection with our vast uh, distance running history here in Philadelphia. So, uh, see you out in the roads and take care. Thanks, man.